how to improve on classical guitar. I'm so glad that you're tuning in today. Uh, we have questions such as, why didn't Santa bring me the guitar I wanted? How to shape my nails, secrets for good tone. How do you get the left hand pinky to cooperate? What are some good exercises for that? And we'll talk about more, including your questions. Uh, so again, I'm glad to have all of you tuning in. Uh, Cat in the Bookshelf there at 10 p.m. in Italy. Uh, Colin, Gord, um, I see several of you are hypo uh, from Northeast China. And uh, so all of you, I'm glad that you're tuning in today and uh, welcome to the stream. We'll go ahead and get started. So why didn't Santa bring me the guitar I wanted? That was one of the questions sent in advance. I can only assume that you were naughty. Sorry about that. Or maybe you just didn't get in your Christmas list far enough in advance to Santa and he didn't see it in time. Um, in all seriousness, I hope you got a guitar for Christmas because what better gift could there be, right? Uh, but if you didn't, uh, maybe there's time to buy a guitar in the weeks and months to come. Uh, so fun, lighthearted question uh, there from Danny Shoemaker. Um, another question that I got in advance was from Dan Lance, and he said, are there any songs or exercises that can strengthen or improve the left hand pinky's accuracy or dexterity? So the left hand pinky is just not as strong and skillful as the other fingers. So it's definitely a challenge to get the left hand pinky to do what we need it to do. Um, now some players, you know, maybe just play without the left hand pinky, just don't even worry about that. But uh, for many players, uh, you're gonna want the left hand pinky in a lot of classical literature. And so uh, you need exercises to train that. So a couple of my favorite exercises, I really like the Segovia slur exercise. I have a video here on the channel of that, the one that goes. And Segovia wisely doubles up on the pinky. So the three, four hammer on, he does twice as many times as the other. Also the pull off, the reverse of that. Again, he doubles up on the pinky pull off. And so that's just a really good exercise. So when I do that exercise on the hammer ons, I leave the finger on the string. And then the pull offs, I leave the finger against the adjacent string. So I'm doing kind of a rest stroke uh, pull off. And so uh, that is an excellent exercise for the dexterity and accuracy of the left hand pinky. Another one I really like uh, goes like this, one, two, three, four, four, three, two, one, one, four, three, four, two, four, three, four. And that's really working out the pinky and the alternation of the pinky with the other left hand fingers. Uh, so I really like that exercise. And you can do it up the fretboard in various positions. So that is another excellent exercise. The other thing I would say about developing the pinky is that uh, like with any technique aspect, it matters more how you practice than what you practice. So you could do the exercises I'm talking about, you could do another exercise, you could do another uh, particular piece of music, uh, but whatever it is that you're practicing, uh, it would be important to focus on how you're practicing. It would be important to practice uh, really tuning in and paying attention to how you're moving your fingers. So noticing that you're keeping the left hand pinky close to the fingerboard, not flying away, not pointing toward the ceiling, uh, making sure that the pinky side of the palm is not too far from the neck. And this is one that I struggle with at times where sometimes I even tend to have uh, the palm too far away and the pinky's gonna straighten out. Uh, so that's something I have to watch for myself and definitely I see that in a lot of students uh, that they end up with the pinky side of the palm uh, too far away. So I would really encourage you uh, to have that pinky side of the palm close in to the fingerboard. Um, so those are a couple things that I would think about with the pinky. Uh, so another question that I got in advance uh, was about uh, the nails. 
And this was from Donald Elder, and he said, Nails and Secrets of Good Tone. So when we think about the fingernails uh, for the right hand, uh, first off, I would say you want to think of the right length, shape, and smoothness. So typically for the index, middle, and ring fingers, I like the length to be about a sixteenth of an inch past the end of the fingertip. Uh, for the thumb, maybe an eighth of an inch past the end of the fingertip. For the length, as far as the shape, I like kind of an upward ramp shape. So I kind of file uh, this way. So I'm going to contact the string initially over here and um, this, the string will kind of slide up and off my nail. So I want kind of a ramp shape uh, on the nail and I want to file it like that, create that ramp shape, and then I round the edges. I also file underneath the nail and round the edges. And sometimes I've had students say to me, well, hey, doesn't everyone's uh, fingernails grow a little bit differently? And the answer is yes, absolutely. Everybody's nails are a little different, but I find that filing in this way will help most nails uh, because regardless, you know, if your nails are bent up or bent down or some of those different shapes, uh, more curved, more flat. Um, you know, if you file like I've described, kind of create the ramp shape, round the edges, file underneath and round the edges, the file is going to hit whatever parts of your nail are kind of in the way of the string, so to speak, and uh, will we'll sort of adjust off as needed. So I like uh, that way of filing, flat across the end, round the edges, uh, flat underneath, round the edges, creating that ramp shape. So length shape and then smoothness. For smoothness, I use this kind of 500 grain for square inch sandpaper uh, that comes from the 5M company um, or 3M company, I'm sorry. 500 grain per square inch from the 3M company. Uh, you can get it from stringsbymail.com and uh, other sites like that. But uh, I find this to be really useful for just getting the nails really smooth. Uh, so when you're thinking about the nails and getting good tone, then I think um, you know making sure that you have the right length, shape, and smoothness is important. Once you feel like the nails are in good shape, uh, then you want to get a good combination of nail and flesh. So you really want to get the string between the nail and the skin and just make sure that you're getting a really clear and good tone uh, from the nail. Uh, so that would be the next thing I would say about uh, tone. Uh, so good question there. I also had a question from Zivi Rothenberg. He said, I always break my middle fingernail. What can I do to stop it? And uh, this is another issue. You know, if you're going to play with nails, how do you avoid breaking the nails? Uh, so the first thing I would say about avoiding breaking the nails would be just being aware of activities you do in daily life uh, that are especially likely to break the nails. So if I go out and I'm working in the yard, um, you know, if I'm cutting limbs off of trees or something like that, um, then I'm going to wear work gloves, some heavy duty gloves that are going to protect my fingers and nails because guitar playing is important to me. So I don't want to break the nails while I'm out working in the yard. Uh, so wearing gloves, something like that uh, can be helpful. Um, also, uh, you know, just again, everyday life things like if it's opening a soda can or something like that, and you know, hey, this is going to be likely to break my nails. Maybe I can open my soda can with my uh, fretting hand instead of my plucking hand, so I'm not breaking those nails uh, that I need for plucking. Uh, so that'd be another thing that I would say about avoiding breaking the nails. Also, you know, just the strength of the nails themselves. You know, if you're getting uh, plenty of vitamins in your diet, you're getting plenty of calcium and things like that, uh, you're eating plenty of protein in your diet, that's going to help the nails to grow over time, uh, having that uh, consistent diet. Also, uh, some people take supplements. I actually take a nail vitamin. Uh, it's a vitamin that is intended to specifically help the growth of nails. Uh, so having kind of a vitamin supplement like that can be helpful. And there are also nail hardener things that you can paint onto the nail, uh, oils and things like that, that will help the nails to get harder. So uh, that can help as well. If you have questions about um, guitar, feel free to drop those in the chat and I'd love to answer your questions and uh, really appreciate you tuning in uh, to the stream today. Another question I got in advance was from Jonathan Powell uh, who said, do you ever explore microtonal composers, either gamelan style or Harry Parch style, using guitar or prepared guitar? Just curious. Uh, so I haven't done much uh, with microtonal guitar. You know, there are some players you can find on YouTube uh, that have these cool necks that have staggered frets specially designed for microtonal playing. And, um, you know, I, there was one video that went viral here a few weeks ago where the guy did a uh, Bach piece 
and, but he did the Bach piece with sort of microtonal playing, um, imitating a specific Baroque period tuning. And then, yeah, sometimes there's microtonal playing that people will do with um, like Middle Eastern music, which is heavily microtonal. Or, yeah, there's composers like Harry Parch that have experimented with this. So, yeah, I personally have not done a lot of that, but I do sometimes enjoy watching some of those players with the microtonal fretboards. I don't have a big interest in getting a microtonal fretboard myself, uh, but I think it's really cool. So, Jonathan, thanks for that uh, question. I see Colin says, Sean, I have an ongoing problem with breaking nails. I've been taking biotin for about three weeks now. It has definitely helped nail strength. Hey, that's good to know. Yeah, the multivitamin I take does have biotin in it, and that is one of the main things that uh, you hear about as far as a supplement for nails is biotin. So it's good to hear that that has helped. And uh, so, yeah, taking a, a supplement like that of biotin or, or kind of a, a multivitamin designed specifically to help nails can help with the nail strength and avoiding breaking them. Uh, very good. Awesome. Another question I got is, after tuning my guitar, some guitarists suggest as a final test that I play an E major chord. Would that be a waste of time if my electronic tuner is accurate? So, you know, just strumming all the strings um, in an E major chord after you've tuned with a tuner. Is that a waste of time? No, not necessarily. One of the things I've shared before about tuning is I wouldn't necessarily start tweaking all the individual strings to the chord because, again, the guitar is an equal tempered instrument. If you start tweaking to one specific chord, you're trying to do what's called pure intonation, which works great if that's the only chord you're gonna play for the rest of the day. But as soon as you start playing other chords, uh, where roots, thirds, and fifths are on different strings and it doesn't work anymore. So like if I tune the E chord and I decide, hey, I'm gonna tweak specifically to make the E chord sound better, then I play a G chord, the G chord may be out of tune. Uh, so would it be useful to strum an E chord after I've tuned with a tuner? Yeah, absolutely. It's useful to notice that I do something wrong. So if you strum and the E chord sounds just horrifically out of tune after you used a tuner, you probably did something wrong or your tuner battery's dying or, or whatever. But, um, but if the E chord sounds good, I would not uh, want you to be trying to make some really small tweaks to make the E chord sound better because again, sometimes you can kind of lead yourself astray uh, if you're doing that. Um, so good question. Another question I got is how would I know if my guitar is playable? What if its neck is warped slightly? Won't that affect the tuning of the strings? What procedure do you have which checks the guitar neck for being warped. Um, yeah, it's a good question. Yeah, if the guitar neck is warped, that's gonna cause you some pretty serious problems. I mean, just nothing is gonna sound good if the neck of the guitar is warped. So how would you um, know that? Well, first of all, um, you know, you can look down the neck and just kind of see if you can tell visibly if it bows. If it bows visibly, then it's probably pretty warped. So that's a, definitely a bad thing, but uh, you can sight down the neck. Uh, you can also hold a yardstick or meter stick up against the neck just to see you know, if it deviates from a yardstick or a meter stick um, as far as being warped, and that can be helpful. Um, also, just checking the 12th fret, I like to play the 12th fret notes and the 12th fret um, harmonics. And if those are different, then that probably means either there's warping of the neck or some other problem with the neck of the guitar uh, that the intonation is not right. And uh, that would be a fundamental issue with a guitar. So if you can visibly see warping of the neck, if you can compare a meter stick or yardstick to it and notice warping, if you can play the 12th fret fretted note and the 12th fret harmonic and those are different, all of those are warning signs. If it's a guitar you're thinking about buying, don't buy it. If it's a guitar you already own, you may need to take it to a luthier or guitar repair person uh, to get some of those issues dealt with. I see Brian says, hi, Sean, any tips on figuring chords out by ear? Happy holidays. Well, happy holidays, Brian. Thank you for that question. Um, yeah, this is a great question. And I think what I would suggest is, first of all, let's start with triads. Now, of course, there's all kinds of sevenths, ninths, elevenths, thirteenths, and things like that. But if you can figure out whether the basic chord is a major or minor triad underlying you know, the 7th, 9th, 11th, 13th, or whatever, then that would be the place to start. So uh, what I would suggest is, you know, you're trying to figure out a particular chord by ear, you really need to know two things, the root and um, the quality. 
So in other words, is this a root of F, a root of G, a root of A, a root of B, etc.? And then the quality, is it a major chord or is it a minor chord or you know could even be diminished or augmented? But for simplicity, let's stick to major and minor because those are the most frequently used chords. So if you're trying to figure it out by ear, and let's say you know you hear a particular chord um, in a recording, maybe you pause the recording, you're like, hey, I wonder what chord that was. What I would start with is try to find the root. And what I would suggest is just going along the sixth string. So like, okay, I heard the root of that chord in the recording. Is that an F, an F sharp, a G, a G sharp, an A, you know? And pretty soon, hopefully, if you've developed your ear, you'll be able to lock in and go, oh wait that's a B flat or an A sharp you know it's this note that I'm hearing that is the root of that chord then you know let me play this and see does it sound like a major chord or does it sound like a minor chord you know stereotypically a lot of people would say the major chord sounds happier and the minor chord sounds sadder and so which of those chords you know which of those qualities is it so that's what I would say kind of the quick way slide along the sixth string to find the root and then try to find out is it a major or minor chord once you do that, then you can experiment with other things like, um, you know, hey, is it a 7th, a 9th, 11th, a 13th, things like that. Um, you know, could it be a diminished or augmented chord? Again, those are less common, but they do occur. So, uh, but if you can get really good at just determining the root and the quality of major and minor chords, that's a great place to start. Now, by the way, there are websites where you can practice recognizing chords by ear. Uh, one is musictheory.net. Another is teoria.com, T-E-O-R-I-A.com, and you can go there and it'll play a chord for you and ask you, you know, is this a major or minor chord? And then you can say, you know, what you think it is. And so that will help. Uh, another question, Brian says, how about if the chord is an inversion? Well, you know, that's a good question. And so a lot of times what I would suggest is try to figure out uh, the root regardless of inversion. So in other words, if you can figure out like, hey, I think this is probably a B flat chord. Now it doesn't sound like the bass note of this is a B flat, but um, I think it's a B flat chord. Then from there you can figure out the inversion. So, hey, this is a B flat chord, but actually I'm hearing a D in the bass. Uh, so it's a B flat chord, but with a D in the bass. So I would probably go for the root first. Now you could do it the other way. You could be like, oh, I'm hearing a D in the bass, but I played a D chord. Whoa, it's not a D chord. Hmm. What other chords could have a D note in it? Well, a G chord, you know, could have that note in it. A B flat chord could have that note in it. Um, hmm. Which of those could it be? So you could kind of do trial and error that way and you may need to. Uh, but I would probably start with trying to figure out what the root of the chord is and then uh, figure out which note of that chord is in the bass. Um, so that would be my preferred way of, of going about that. Uh, a good question. Another uh, question I got is, if my fretboard is slightly warped, do I need a new fretboard since my guitar possesses a truss rod? I hardly ever see a classical guitar with a truss rod, but my Cordoba 7 has one. I hope it has a useful purpose. Yeah, so like I said, if, you're, if your fretboard is warped, it's a pretty serious problem, uh, but a, you know, a luthier or guitar repair person may be able to straighten the neck back out for you. If it has a truss rod, your, your chances are a little bit better because with a truss rod, you can kind of put a tool down in there and adjust and it will adjust the relief of the neck. That is how much it bows backward and forward. And uh, that can be helpful. A cat on the bookshelf says, having settled, for instance, that the chord is a major chord in a major tonality, how can you figure out uh, one, four, or five? Well, um, that's a good question. So if you're trying to figure out like, hey, I know I hear a B flat chord, but what is the overall key? Um, I would listen to, you know, kind of where the song starts and ends uh, because a lot of times, um, yeah, and I apologize that the video keeps uh, being choppy today. I'm just having some connection issues, so I'll have to continue to work on that for next week. Uh, for today, I'm just going to try to keep going uh, for the moment. But um, as far as figuring out the overall key of the piece, um, I'm generally going to listen to where does the piece start and end. So does the piece uh, start on this chord and end on this chord? Then it's probably an F. 
does the piece start and end on this this chord then it's probably in E or whatever so I'm generally going to uh, look for where does a particular um, piece start and end and I'm going to assume that where it starts and ends is usually um, the key of the piece uh, so that's what I'm going to do there uh, and that's that's going to help me kind of determine the overall uh, key of the piece and then as far as that if I know this is an F chord and I hear a B flat then I know it's a four or if it's in the key of F and I hear a C then I know it's a five uh, so yeah listening to the start and end of the piece helps me determine the key and then uh, from there just like I said going up the sixth string to figure out those individual chords I know Brian says thank you so much um, I'll check out the websites you've mentioned yeah I think those exercises on musictheory.net and tegoria.com can really help uh, with the figuring out uh, particular um, chords and uh, you know doing it by ear so good question uh, another question I got is how can I stop my bass string from buzzing when I pluck it it sounds okay if I pluck it rather gently but that doesn't give me the volume that I need well this is a good one this can be um, several things you know if you're plucking a bass string and it buzzes it may be that you just kind of have found the limit of volume that your particular guitar will do and so you know sometimes you may be you know, plucking hard and um, you know if you get to a certain point you get this buzz that's just the loudest that that particular guitar will go and so you know sometimes you just have to acknowledge like I can't play louder than a certain volume uh, without you know the guitar sounding bad uh, so that would be something to be aware of um, but uh, you know if your guitar normally sounds good and you're getting a buzz I would also pay attention to like how close am I to the fret wire wire if I'm too far back from the fret wire I may get a buzz so am I close enough to the fret wire uh, that's something to uh, be aware of and um, also you know you may find that your low tension strings are buzzing and if you're really trying to push for volume you may want to try high tension strings the high tension strings are usually a little harder to press down and so for most people I think normal tension strings would be fine but if you're really like hey I'm not getting enough volume you may want to try high tension strings uh, to be able to dig in more without the buzz so make sure you're close to the fret maybe try high tension strings you could also have somebody raise your action uh, of the guitar that is raise how far uh, the strings are from the fretboard and um, you know you can also um, again just realize sometimes this is just the limit of this guitar I can't play any louder on this guitar and uh, I may have to uh, just kind of put up with that so good question there if you have other questions uh, leave them in the chat and thanks for bearing with me with the technical issues I'll continue to work on solutions for those uh, for next week I think things have settled down on the technical front at least a little bit all right uh, another question is is it best to have the action adjust by a trained technician yeah in general I would recommend that unless you really have some experience working on guitars I would uh, suggest getting a trained person either at a local guitar store local luthier or something like that uh, to work on your guitar because um, you know if you're inexperienced and you work on your own guitar you can uh, maybe cause yourself some problems I uh, remember having a student years ago who tried to work on his own, own guitar now granted this was a younger student he was in high school he tried to work on his own guitar and uh, he ended up making it pretty much unplayable and ultimately had to get a new guitar um, so that's an extreme case but um, you know if you're gonna try to work on it yourself like you know if you already know hey, I have some pretty good skills of working with tools and woodworking and things like that um, just you know watch some good videos first on guitar repair and make sure you understand what you're doing before you just start um, you know maybe filing your nut, nut off or filing your saddle off or some of those things uh, because if you file them down too short you would have to replace them in order for it to work and uh, you know replacing them is harder than just filing them down so that's that's one of the common things I see people is like hey my actions too high I want to file the the nut down so you file the nut down now the guitar is unplayable and uh, you don't have another nut you know maybe you try to order a nut and then replace it and so um, in general I would start with a guitar repair person uh, good question there if you have other questions uh, do leave those in the chat and um, another question I got in advance if I compared the sound of a solid soundboard to a cheap synthetic laminated soundboard uh, would I recognize the cheaper guitar right away um, 
it's a good question and maybe um, you know if you've uh, done a lot of listening and uh, paid attention to the sounds of different types of guitars you might notice the difference between a uh, solid soundboard and a laminated but uh, if you're less experienced you might not notice the difference so it's a good question and it really kind of depends on your experience in listening to uh, different guitars whether you'd notice that difference but I find that a higher end guitar with a solid soundboard is going to have kind of a a richer sound whereas a laminated soundboard is going to be a little more one-dimensional uh, usually I see Brian says what thing do I need to be reminded of if I want to pursue guitar professionally um, especially as a youtuber mm. well this is an interesting question so I would say there's two parts one is um, you know how do you pursue guitar professionally the other is uh, how do you succeed as a youtuber with guitar uh, so I'll take a crack at both of those. Um, I would say that I've succeeded as a professional guitarist in a variety of ways, performing and teaching, etc. Uh, YouTuber, you know, that's a complicated one uh, because I feel like there's more to YouTube than just guitar skill. Uh, so I'll talk about those separately, but that's a really interesting question. So first of all, if you're going to pursue guitar professionally, you really need to develop a high level of guitar skill. I mean, that probably seems obvious, uh, but in other words, if you're... Uh, like, hey, I'm not that great at guitar, but I want to pursue guitar professionally, then you need to practice a lot. And so most people who pursue guitar professionally, you know, they're playing three, four, five, six hours a day. And if you're not doing that, then you probably need to develop a plan. How am I going to work up uh, to playing more hours a day? So maybe I'm going to work to... Um, you know do this gradually if I'm used to practicing an hour a day I'm gonna start practicing an hour and a half a day and then next month I'll start practicing two hours a day and on like that so just playing guitar a lot and getting extremely skilled at the guitar would be necessary for playing professionally uh, then beyond you know like let's assume that you're really really good at the guitar you can play at a very high level well, then there's just some sort of business development skills that you have to have. So if you're going to perform, you have to be willing to reach out and find places to perform or you have to find an agent to do that for you. But one way or another, you're going to have to find places to perform. You're going to have to find opportunities to record. You're going to have to find opportunities to teach. You know, am I going to teach at a school? Am I going to find my own private students? All those sorts of things. Uh, so you're going to have to develop some of those kind of business skills of developing performance opportunities, teaching opportunities, etc. Then um, YouTube. Okay, YouTube's a whole other animal. So when I started posting videos on YouTube several years ago, I knew zero about YouTube. I only knew about guitar. So what I did is I turned on a camera and I just started talking about guitar or playing guitar. And you know, if you don't know anything about YouTube, that's an okay place to start. Just turn on a camera and start playing guitar or teaching guitar. But uh, one of the things that I found, um, I kind of took a couple years off from YouTube uh, a couple years ago and then started back. When I started back, I decided, you know, I really need to learn more about YouTube. And so I learned more about how to make the audio better. I learned more about how to make the video better. Uh, unfortunately, today's stream is not really showing those things uh, the way that I normally do on my videos. But um, so I learned more about kind of the videography aspects. I learned a bit more about video editing. Like if I want to insert sheet music and tablature into my videos, how do I do that? Um, so, you know, I've had to learn a lot of things as a YouTuber. So I would say specifically as a YouTuber, not only do you need to have the really good guitar skills and some business skills, you also need to have some, you know, videography, video editing skills and things like that. Uh, but, you know, all those things are learnable. So what I would say is if you're really committed to doing that, uh, just commit yourself to being an ongoing learner. You know, where do I need to focus my learning? Do I need to focus on learning more stuff on the guitar next? Uh, do I need to focus learning more video skill next or audio skill? Do I need to focus on, um, you know, learning more business skills? Uh, but I would say there's kind of a lot of different aspects there. So hopefully that helps. If you have more targeted questions on a specific aspect of YouTube or a specific aspect of being a professional guitarist, uh, be happy to talk about those too. Uh, but yeah, it's an excellent question. And um, I, I certainly am an ongoing learner and, uh, you know, trying to figure out today why I'm having glitches in my live stream. And so uh, always trying to learn and improve. So um, great question. 
Uh, another question that I got was when shopping for a classical guitar, do you compare two guitars for ability to sustain a note? Um, yeah, I mean, sustain is definitely something I would think about. I find that sometimes with higher end guitars uh, that, you know, if you play a note and it really just rings out, uh, that that is a great thing as far as, um, you know, the quality of a guitar. If the note just dies quickly, then maybe it's not as good of a guitar. So definitely I would compare guitars with sustain. And as far as comparing two guitars, I do like to do kind of an A-B test where like, hey, let me play a particular passage on this guitar, put this guitar down, pick up another guitar, play that same passage on that guitar and do the same thing over and over again. So maybe I'll play a passage like Lagrima where I'm really listening to the trebles. And then I'll do that on the second guitar I'm comparing it to. And then I'll do something on the basses. You know, like the melody from Villa Lobos Prelude 1. And I'll compare that on the other guitar. So, uh, you know, if I'm comparing two guitars, just going back and forth, back and forth, play a passage on one, play a passage on another is a good way to compare. And I do like to compare the sustain. I think that is a good thing to notice. Um, so if you have other questions, uh, do leave those in the chat. Um, another question I got was, some guitars have necks that are quite thin, other guitars have thicker necks. Does neck thickness make any difference in the sound? You know, that's a good question. And in my experience, uh, neck thickness of the guitar does not make a huge difference in the sound of the guitar. Um, some luthiers might have a rationale for why, um, you know, the the neck is going to conduct some sound and change the, the sound of the guitar. But really, I find that neck thickness is more kind of player preference. You know, do you like kind of a thick neck where you feel like, hey, I've really got something to grab onto? Do you like a thinner neck where it's kind of a closer distance between your thumb and your fingers? Um, you know, that's a, a good question uh, to to consider. And I don't I don't have a hard and fast answer uh, to that. So um, you know, I, I think that in general, it's just more preference whether you like a thick or a thin neck. Uh, so if you have questions, leave them in the chat. Uh, another question I got is my guitar is not a cutaway. So playing notes on the high um, 13th through 17th frets is very awkward for me. What do you do with your body position or your hand position to play in those awkward upper frets? So yeah, certainly you could get a cutaway. As I've said in other videos, sometimes that diminishes the vibrating body of the guitar. So a lot of classical players kind of stay away from the cutaways. Another option would be to have an elevated fingerboard, which Thomas Humphrey pioneered and some other players have done to get into those upper positions. Uh, but if you have just kind of a standard classical guitar um, to get in those upper positions, uh, a lot of times I will drop my left elbow a bit, kind of bring it out in front of the guitar, and that allows me to get my arm up over the body of the guitar. And uh, so that's what I would suggest is I would suggest that you kind of drop your elbow, come out in front of the guitar and, um, you know, that gives you just more access. So let me kind of show you what I mean. Like, let's say I'm trying to reach a high position and I just keep my left arm where it normally is. And I try to reach those high positions. I'm going to end up really changing my wrist position in an uncomfortable way. And I could do that. I could just kind of really crank my wrist into a crazy bend to try to get around there. But what I'd prefer to do is get my whole arm involved a little bit. Now, and I'll just exaggerate, I could get my whole left arm over the guitar really easily with the elbow forward like this and just kind of get that whole forearm up there. Um, so, you know, if I am just demonstrating with like a chromatic scale, sorry, let me not try to talk and play. I can't seem to do both at the same time. So just bringing that arm forward gives me a lot better access to those higher frets. And then I can kind of bring the arm back uh, when I'm, you know, 12th, 12th to first fret again. Uh, so good question there. Another question is, how do you make sure that notes uh, don't buzz when playing the guitar? Yeah, and I did touch on this one a little bit earlier. Again, sometimes it's an issue with the guitar where a guitar just buzzes when you play a certain fret. Maybe it's set up wrong or there's an issue with the fret or something like that. Um, maybe if you raise the action of the guitar or use higher tension strings, that will reduce the buzzes. 
but also just technique wise I would make sure that you're playing right by the fret wire and playing right by the fret wire is going to make sure that you get um, you know kind of your clearest tone and that you avoid buzzes so I would encourage you to make sure you're playing right by the fret uh, when you are um, you know fretting each note and that will tend to help you avoid buzzes so another question I got was uh, with your right hand do you ever keep the tip joint quite straight intentionally not collapsing it as you pluck the strings with it I see Julian Bream seems to play with an uncollapsed fingertip joint almost all the time um, does a collapsed fingertip produce any more power than a straight fingertip or is this not a factor uh, so that's a great question so when we're thinking about the right hand fingertip so this joint what should happen to this joint well to me it kind of depends on whether you're doing rest stroke or free stroke uh, so um, apoyando or rest stroke uh, or are you doing free stroke tirando uh, it, it changes for me what I do with my fingertips so for me if I am doing a rest stroke I do let the fingertip give a little bit I don't know that I'd say collapse but I let it have just a little bit of give because for the rest stroke it allows the fingertip to slide through the string a little bit easier uh, but if I'm doing a free stroke I actually keep the tip joint quite firm and a little bit bent I'm not a big fan of keeping the tip joint straight as the question kind of describes but I, I do think that having the the finger bent and uh, using that I think is um, uh, is a good thing for free stroke so for me uh, a bent fingertip for free stroke uh, that is at a rather firm fingertip or a more relaxed uh, fingertip with a little give in it um, I would do I would do the the curved one for free stroke I do the relaxed one for rest stroke uh, good question there um, another question I got do the fingertips of your left hand ever collapse as they press downward on the strings yes yeah, sometimes in general I try to avoid this uh, you know obviously a bar um, you know especially like a hinge bar you know where you're barring on the bass strings and not the trebles or something like that unavoidably you're gonna have to collapse a joint of the left hand to do something like that but in general I'm trying to keep the joints of the left hand fingers from collapsing I've had students before who have uh, double jointed fingers and it's especially hard for them not to collapse but even with those students I generally work with even a double jointed student to try to avoid collapsing the, the joints because what I find is the collapsing joints uh, introduce a level of unpredictability into the technique um, so in other words like let's say I'm trying to apply pressure on this note so I try to apply pressure now and if I let my tip joint collapse it's like I, the pressure is coming now no now no now in other words the pressure is delayed while that joint collapses and then it finally arrives on the string uh, whereas if I keep the tip joint firm then the pressure arrives right when I want it to uh, so that firm tip joint is preferred again sometimes in a crazy chord shape or you know a hinge bar or something like that I would collapse a tip joint in the left hand but my general preference is avoiding collapsing a tip joint uh, in the left hand fingers so good question there uh, if you have another question uh, feel free to leave that in the chat um, another question that I got in advance is uh, when you're playing the guitar should the side of your right hand fingers ever touch each other as they move past to pluck the strings or should they remain separated does it matter yeah I think that your right hand fingers can absolutely brush against each other as you're playing that's kind of a norm for me um, you know I can feel my index and middle fingers brushing against each other when I'm alternating them doing you know I am alternation uh, absolutely I think it's fine for those fingers uh, to brush against each other um, I've seen you know occasional teachers that will be like oh you know you need to keep your right hand fingers separate I find that generally creates more tension and is undesirable so I would let the fingers be close together I would let them brush against each other it's not a problem uh, for that to happen so a uh, good question there I see Colin says Ray alternate picking Sean I find that when I'm doing an ascending scale my um, I am is accurate however when descending I always make mistakes any advice well a good question uh, there could be a couple things going on here Colin uh, one would be 
you know, does it have anything to do with your arm movement coming back? In other words, you know, when you're going down this way, you're kind of using gravity to take the right hand, you know, toward the uh, treble strings. But when you're coming back this way, uh, you're basically having to pull the arm back. So do you feel like you have kind of an efficient movement of the arm kind of intentionally bringing the hand back? And, and let me kind of break this down a little bit more. So in other words, what I'm talking about is string crossing. In other words, as I'm playing on each specific string, I'm moving just slightly my whole hand uh, depending on where I'm playing. So um, one exercise I like to do to work on the IM alternation is to do three notes per string. Doing that um, sort of simulates what we often do in scales and it also just allows for some, you know, awkward or unusual crossings from one string to another. So like I am, 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 and you'll notice the whole time my hand's moving down slightly. Then as I come back, my hand's moving up slightly. M I am, 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 I. So I want the hand to be able to smoothly move across and back. Now, another thing that could be happening is maybe you're not comfortable with the specific string crossings on the way back. So maybe on the way up, you know, I am, 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 I am. So like maybe you have an uncomfortable string crossing, I on the higher string, M to the lower string, and you're just not comfortable with that. But in scales, you know, we end up doing that. I certainly try to strategize my scales, especially if it's a short scale passage. I'm trying to think of what's the minimum number of uncomfortable crossings I can have. In other words, I don't want to have I on the higher pitch string and M on the lower pitch string when I can avoid it. But sometimes I can't avoid that. So um, I also just need to get uh, used to doing the uncomfortable crossings at times. So again, that exercise of three notes per string, it kind of forces me to do both comfortable and uncomfortable crossings, both on the way from basses to trebles, also on the way from trebles to basses. Uh, so I would focus on an exercise like this. And that is going to really help you um, to develop that movement. But really focus on the movement of the right hand and making sure that you're smoothly moving the whole hand, um, you know, gradually down and then gradually back. So if the problems are all as you come back to the bases, then it may be that kind of your movement of bringing the hand this way is just not a, a smooth movement. So that would be something to think about. Uh, if you have other questions, feel free to leave those in the chat. Uh, another question is, how is a guitar's scale length measured? And then, um, you know, how many centimeters in scale length is a standard guitar? Well, a standard classical guitar is usually 650 millimeters in scale length. Uh, so that's 65 centimeters or 650 millimeters. And then scale length is measured, um, you know, usually from the, uh, the saddle here on the bridge to the nut. So these kind of little white strips on the bridge and up here. Uh, the nut and saddle, that is the scale length. It's basically the vibrating string length. Uh, so when you're thinking about a different length guitar, you know, 650 is the standard for classical guitars. Some are longer, like my Ruck is 664, um, and some are shorter, like 640 or 630. Um, these days, it's more common to find classical guitars with a 640 scale length. Um, maybe 20, 30 years ago, it was more common to find the longer 660 scale length, but um, classical guitars kind of continue to oscillate around the 650 that Torres established in the 1800s. Uh, so, uh, but that scale length is again the distance uh, from the nut to the saddle. Uh, another question, does my guitar need some kind of adjustment if the space between the bottom of my first string and the top of the 12th fret measures at six millimeters? Yeah, that's probably a little far away uh, if your first string is six millimeters away from the neck. Uh, I would want to uh, to have that action lowered, you might need to get a professional uh, luthier to adjust that. Uh, another question, how do you know if the nut grooves of a guitar are properly cut? Uh, good question. So yeah, I, if you're not sure if your nut grooves are properly cut, then I would encourage you to take the guitar to a luthier or guitar repair person, um, you know, and have them check it out. Unless you have some experience with guitar building or guitar repair, it's going to be hard without getting some advice from somebody who has experience who can look at, look at your guitar for you. 
I see that uh, the cat on the bookshelf, I love that username, says, I am working on a transcription of Handel's uh, Messiah Overture, nice, uh, made by my guitar teacher. Uh, I made some contributions as well, and I find some passages quite challenging. I would love if you can review it. Uh, cool. Well, I probably won't be able to uh, do that for the stream, not having the sheet music in front of me, but I might be able to do that in a future stream. Uh, so you can email me uh, Sean Beavers, at, or it's Sean at SeanBeavers.us. So that's S-E-A-N, then the at symbol, and then Sean Beavers, S-E-A-N-B-E-A-V-E-R-S dot U-S. Uh, so feel free to shoot me an email uh, with the sheet music you're talking about. Maybe I can take a look and I might even be able to uh, look over that in a future live stream. Um, I love Handel's Messiah. I've not uh, spent much time playing it on guitar, but I do love uh, Handel's Messiah as a piece of music. So awesome. Very good. Well, I'm going to wrap up the stream in just a few minutes. Uh, are there any closing questions uh, just as I prepare to wrap up the stream? Uh, if they are, uh, just drop those in the chat. And um, one other thing that I'm going to mention is just uh, warming up. Uh, when you warm up with a guitar, I encourage just starting uh, with uh, some simple open strings, P-I-M-A, A-M-I-P, uh, doing some simple left hand exercises like one, two, three, four, four, three, two, one, uh, those sorts of things. And uh, then I, from there I go into scales, like, you know, playing through the Segovia scales. Uh, I like to play through all 12 of those as a warm up, uh, or all 24, you know, include not just all 12 majors, but all 12 minors as well. And then uh, going into arpeggios, I love to practice the arpeggio from Bo Lobos Etude 1. Um, that arpeggio is a really good exercise. You can start very slowly as a warm up and kind of gradually, you know, increase the tempo. Um, I also like um, doing the, you know, Segovia slur exercises that I mentioned earlier. Uh, those are really good uh, warm ups. And I like to do those on the sixth string because it kind of provides the most resistance uh, for the left hand. So uh, thank you very much, everyone, for tuning in. I see Colin says, thank you, Sean. Uh, thank you, Colin, and thank you, everyone. Uh, for tuning into the stream. Um, so far, I've gotten only positive feedback about the 4 p.m. Uh, Eastern U.S. time. Um, and uh, so, yeah, I think that would be great. Uh, yeah, and the cat in the bookshelf, as far as emailing you, I don't know what your email address is. So um, you can try to find me maybe on Facebook or Instagram or something, or, you know, drop me your, your email address uh, here in the chat perhaps or something. But I'm not sure how to email you because I'm not sure of your email address, but um, uh, I can I can drop my email address in the chat and uh, perhaps that would help as well. So my email address is now in the chat, uh, but you could also find me on Facebook or Instagram and mes message me there. Uh, my name is Sean Beavers, uh, so you can find me there. So thank you all for tuning in on the live stream. I'm sorry for some of the glitching. Both last week and this week, I've been fighting some of these glitches. I am live streaming from my home instead of my office last week and this week, so that may be some of the issue for the technical problems. Um, I'll be resuming streaming in my office either next week or the week after. I might be at home again next week, but uh, either way, hopefully I can fix these glitches so they won't be an issue going forward. But I thank you for your patience hanging in anyway. And uh, so until next time, keep making music.